to the She Leads podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Garland, CEO and founder of She Leads Media, a global media company dedicated to the advancement of women leaders and entrepreneurs worldwide. I'm also an adjunct professor at NYU and Rice University, where I teach on the topic of entrepreneurship. I'm a mom to two wonderful young men and married to my best friend from college. Join me each week as I dive into raw conversations with remarkable, uncompromising, and inspirational women entrepreneurs and leaders. My hope is that these conversations and their advice will encourage you to put yourself out there and gain the visibility that you and all women deserve. We're all about stripping away the sugar-coated conversations and moving boldly in the direction of our magnificent dreams. For far too long, women have been conditioned to soften their words, modify their actions, and show up in the world to conform to outdated at best and harmful at worst cultural norms and ideals. Why? To keep those who are outside of the power structures from gaining power, prestige, wealth, and influence. This has prevented women from being recognized and respected as the powerful leaders that we truly are. The She Leads podcast is here to shine the light on all the incredible women, to encourage us to show up, speak up, and showcase the amazing work we do, speak with confidence about the innovative and transformational thoughts that we have, and celebrate the positive impact that we are making in this world, both personally and professionally. So let's do this. Let's lead. everybody, and welcome to the She Leads Podcast. This podcast and all of our episodes are brought to you by the She Leads Podcast Network, the network for women by women. I'd like to welcome my next guest, Sunaina Sinha, the Global Head of Private Capital Advisory for Raymond James. She's a regular guest on CNBC and has written for Fast Company on Five Habits to Build Mental Strength. She's been a senior meditator for over 15 years. And she started that at the beginning of her entrepreneurial journey. So welcome to the She Leads podcast, Sunaina. Thank you so much, Adrian, for having me here today. It is a pleasure. So I am so interested to hear all about how meditation has helped you both on your entrepreneurial journey and also as the head of private capital advisory for Raymond James. So why don't you take us back to the beginning because you have a great educational background and uh, so many people I think can relate to, you know, going to school, wanting to graduate and get a great job and then our lives take a different path. Absolutely. I think that life finds you while you're chasing it, right? And that's sort of my favorite saying. So went to some terrific schools for my undergrad, went to Stanford for my undergrad and my master's, both in engineering, Uh, worked for a couple of years in the Bay Area, and then went to Harvard for my MBA. Started working after Harvard Business School in the world of finance, where I continued to build out my skill set. And about uh, in 2011, started my first business, Sibyl Capital which is a financial advisory business focused on advising private equity firms and their investors. Grew the business over 10 years and in 2021, uh, Raymond James, which is a New York Stock Exchange listed Fortune 300 company, came and acquired it. So terrific exit. But beyond that, I sit on the boards of several other businesses that helped entrepreneurs scale their businesses successfully and sell them on. Continue to serve as a non-exec director on the board of a publicly listed clean energy business in Germany on several Stanford boards and so on. Through all of life's vagaries, which by the way, include three children and two dogs, yes. and a, a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Anybody who's been through the entrepreneurial journey, yourself included, knows exactly all the toil that goes on behind the scenes to create anything. One of the things that has really been my one and only secret weapon has been the ability to reset my mental game. Mm. At the beginning, at the end, of every single day. And I learned how to meditate in uh, about 12, 13 years ago. And when I went to my first meditation course called Vipassana, V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A, there's free courses are offered all over the world, um, many centers in the United States and UK and, and Europe. And I found that it taught me in a very deep, concerted boot camp way how to meditate. Mm. And I was able to meditate daily after that. And Adrian, what I would say is the superpower of meditation is as follows. 
it allows you to control your thoughts and emotions, mm. not to let your thoughts and emotions control you. Mm. You know, one of the most frequently asked refrains that I get from lots of people, especially women, is, hey, I wake up at, at two in the morning and my mind is just racing. I can't control my mind. It's just off and I, I can't get it to quiet down and fall asleep again. What meditation teaches you is exactly that. How do you control your mind as opposed to your mind running you? It's incredibly mm. liberating and empowering to know that you get to make those decisions as to what you put in your mind and, and what you let your mind ruminate on. I love this. You know, there's so many things that I've been, you know, I talked to so many different people about all of the uh, things that we come upon in life. And I always ask, like, why were we not taught this in school? You know, like this is a tool that we can have in our toolbox from when we're young, because anybody can do it, right? It's, it's supposed to be with ease, right? We're not supposed to be forcing this. And it, I think, can just help so many just kids even like that are going through middle school and all of the different emotions that come up that we don't even know where these thoughts are, are coming from. Yeah. So I, I love meditation for all of the benefits. I, I wonder how we can sort of get that into our curriculum much earlier on. You know, I think that's exactly the point that I'm trying to work on in my personal life journey. So yesterday I had the privilege by the invitation of the UK Parliament to come in and speak about this on a policy level. Because wow. my big mantra in life is preventative mental health, right? Mm -hmm. By the time we, we speak a lot about mental health as a society over the last five years, it's become part of our zeitgeist to acknowledge that mental health is health. So I'm very happy about that movement yes. in our in our progression as a society but we're always talking about it when things have gone wrong and you need a mental health professional because you feel anxious or you feel sad or depressed or you something has really broken in your steady state psychology and you're seeking help for it mm. nothing wrong with it you should absolutely do that we should have as employers we should offer those tools and services to our employees as a society we should have no stigmas about that yeah. But isn't it so much better? And what we're not spending nearly enough talking uh, time talking about, Adrian, is exactly what you said. The preventative side of mental health. There are tools and techniques that are tried and tested for building the resilience reserves of the mind. Mm. Because hard times come for one and for all. They're coming for each and every one of us. And <laughs> it's not optional, guys. It's happening. Yeah. And the question is, how are we going to deal with it, with it? Do we have the tools to deal with it? Do we have the reserves to take the knocks and continue to move through our lives? And if we don't build them gradually over the years, you know, then it becomes all about remedial, fixing things and trying to get them back into balance. So to your point, I have three children. The only thing I've told them that is non-negotiable is that once a year, we will go to a meditation course together. And oh, wow. you know, yeah, you know, and, and you know how it is, you know, they, they start at eight plus. It's again, the courses of the Vipassana meditations for children, those courses are free all around the world. And, you know, day, it's only for the weekend and Friday afternoon, the kids are digging their noses and the leg is up in the air. By <laughs> Sunday morning, these eight, nine, 10 year olds, they're sitting like little Buddhas. They can, sit for the, <laughs> or they can sit for the 20 minutes and they've learned how to quiet the mind. What yeah. a superpower. And as parents mm. and as adults and as, as educationists, that's all we're there to do is to offer them the tool that, hey, guys, there is a way to quieten your mind. So that when yeah. the mind goes down these bad rabbit holes of self-disparagement and so on, we can bring it back. And here's how. So mm. you know, you, you're speaking to the, to, the, to the choir here and you're speaking to my heart when you say, hey, shouldn't we be teaching this earlier and earlier? And shouldn't we all have it? And, and since I love the name of your podcast so much, she leads, I'll say it's especially important for women. Because mm. as we enter our reproductive years, as we enter our 40s and 50s, when things are happening like, all the time to us, every day, there's some teenagers caring for elderly parents, getting more senior in our careers, so on and so forth. This is when we really need it. And that's the time when we least have the quote unquote time to de dedicate yes. ourselves to the practice. So yes. learn it early is my big advice because it will serve you for, for, for those really tough moments when it's really hard to go out and learn something. 
Oh, such good stuff. I mean, I just want to say preach. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can you talk a little bit? I mean, I know enough about transcendental meditation. I've actually gone through the class and I, you know, I, I practice yoga regularly and, and we always do sort of some guided meditations and things like that. All beautiful. Um, transcendental is the twice a, a day and it's the mantra that's, yes. you know, that uh, slows or or gives the monkey mind something to focus on so you yes. can kind of go deeper and heal your body. How is the Vipassana uh, meditation different? Yeah. So before I tell you about Vipassana meditation, I'll tell you the following. All modalities of meditation are good. Start with yes. something. Start with anything. So, yes. you know, I started with my first meditation course was when I was 12 years old. I tell my parents it was the greatest gift they ever gave me was to take me to that course because mm. even after those two days, I forgot all about meditation for the next 10 years. Yeah. But when things got tough in my 20s, I was mm. like, well, there was that one weekend when I learned how to quiet my mind. What was that? Let me go mm. back to that. Mm. So I still think it was sound meditation. You know, great. But it helped yeah. me how to just to bring the, the volume of the mind down. And then I actually did a couple of years of transcendental meditation. Yeah. And that was great. It took me, learned, taught me how to take the temperature and the and the volume of the mind down a little bit further. The pasta meditation kind of is the purest way. It was the Buddha's meditation technique that the Buddha practiced, and it's a, it's a very purest way of meditating. Now, the, the pasta meditation courses are about a week long, ten days long to be exact. In, in your first course, it's like a meditation boot camp, which allows you to do two different types of meditation: one to quieten the mind and the other to purify the mind. It's a technique mm. that shows you how to focus on body sensations in an equanimous and deeply aware state, such that whatever comes up, you let it pass. The way mm. I describe it, Adrian, is we all carry baggage. We go into these courses carrying 100 tons, right? <laughs> we walk out on the last day at 99 tons. All we did was we cleared one ton. That's one ton of space, clear space, it's a lot of entropy, entropy. There's no vacuums. Energy takes the place of energy. Mm. And that's the one of the fundamental laws of physics. Good energy comes and takes the place of all the baggage, all the clearance you did of any fear or any trauma you were holding on to. Mm. This just teaches you how to clear at a very deep level. And it's, it's incredible because once you learn to do it the first time, it's like riding a bike or swimming. Yeah. You'll always remember. You'll be able to do it every single day. And I started maybe meditating five, 10 minutes a day. And then that became longer and longer. And now I meditate, come what may, kids, travel, work, it doesn't matter for an hour every day. And it's been life changing. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I, I'm very interested. And I, I definitely would, I'm going to put a, a link to just some information because that sounds amazing. So can you talk a little bit about, I know life gets chaotic, especially with kids and growing your career and wanting, you know, wanting to be that archetypal woman that does it all, right? But we know that that is impossible. But when did you, when in your journey did you start meditating? Was that at the beginning of starting your business? Was that sort of when you sold it? Like, give me a yeah. little bit of, of the timing when that happened and how that helped to, you know, ground you so that you could make these incredibly strategic decisions. I mean, you know, hardly any women get past the million dollar mark, let alone mm. sell their companies to a, a company like Raymond James. So can you talk about the intersection of meditation and, and all of these successful choices that you made? Yeah. So starting my business in 2011 went hand in hand with my first Vipassana meditation course, which was also in 2011. It's incredible how the journey sort of commingled because yeah. being an entrepreneur, but especially being a female entrepreneur in finance mm. is incredibly hard. You rare take a lot too. of knocks, rare, hard, brutal, I might add. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, name brutal. <laughs> it, you name it, I've heard it being called it. Uh, and it's, it's not for the faint of heart. And so, you know, it's just the universe bought me meditation in a deep way at a time when I needed it most, when in the early innings of my, um, of my uh, starting my business. Mm. And I now, since 2011, every single year without fail, I've gone to a, a Vipassana meditation course. I go every year for the full 
eight or 10 days, depending on the wow. course I'm taking. And I meditate daily. And what's happened is that year on year, as the complexity of my life increased in 2011, I had no children, I was dating a guy, but I was not married and the business was brand new. So I e one or two clients. I fast forward to 2021 when Raymond James came to buy the business. You know, we were in three offices around the world, um, mm -hmm. selling ourselves to a Fortune 300. And the complexity of the business went through the roof. I was sitting on several boards outside of my day job. I had three children. I was, you know, regular on CNBC and BBC and, and, and being invited to all these great speaking gigs and, and so on. Uh, but what it meant was life had a ton that it was throwing at me. The volume it was like drinking from a fire hose. Yeah. And to your point, my favorite saying that I learned when I was very young, I was actually a college student, when um, a professor of mine at Stanford said to me, you can have it all, just not at the same time. Yeah. And so what meditation <laughs> taught me was the ability to let it go, let whatever it was go, the things I had done, the things I had not gotten the chance to do, the guilt, the pressure, the failures, and the successes. Mm. And so as the years progressed, my meditation became deeper and deeper. It became far more regular. And it, it, there was a one-to-one -one correlation with the regularity of the meditation and the experience of that day. How powerful it is, Adrian, for you, but for any of your listeners to know that nothing externally needs to change for us to have a very different experience of our day. Mm -hmm. We control how we live that day, how we experience that day, whether we're happy or not, whether we're, we're fulfilled or not. And just to know that that outcome was always in my control, that it was not up to a client, whether they were hiring me or not, or paying me or not, or whether my boss was happy with me or not, or an employee is staying or leaving. None of that mattered, or a child for that matter was guilt tripping me for missing a school play. It didn't matter. It just mattered mm -hmm. what, what I choose to experience. And the meditation taught me that that was that peace and equanimity. I could return to that every single day. Okay. There's so much about everything that you just said that is so powerful. Starting from without fail, every year you go away by yourself for 10 days. Yes. That, is, that says to me that you have an incredible relationship with a deep amount of respect, which is that just warms my heart. It also says to me that you know how to set boundaries and stick to them. And that inspires me so much. And it also, the meditation and not sort of being drawn into the highs or the lows as a woman gives us a superpower yes. because we're conditioned to react and respond to others over and above ourselves. And it seems to me what you've just described takes it back so that we take our power back so that we are not focused on what people think about us, say about us, treat us, right? Yes. It, it puts us into this very solid space of it doesn't matter what's going on around me. I am the only one that I need to answer to. That's right. And I think it's meditation has always come down to what I call the sine curve, right? Which is the ups and downs of life. If you think about perhaps before you start meditating, you have really big ups and really low lows. Yeah. You know, meditation will bring that curve down. So it's no, nowhere near as peaks, peaky mm. and trophy. And you decide how wide that sine curve is. Let me put it a different way, probably a bit more approachable. If, if before you started meditating, if something happened with somebody, work or personal, that would have made you angry or upset or anxious for four hours. Yeah. And now, because if you, ha you have a meditation practice, it's three hours and 45 minutes. That's 15 minutes of liberation you brought yourself. Yeah, 15, 15 minutes will, of liberation. <laughs> 15 will become 20, it will become 25, it will become an hour, it will become hours of your life that you'll get back. Yeah. Same thing with intensity. You would have gotten 8 out of 10 anxious or upset, and now you're getting 6 out of 10. Wow, yeah. that's a big difference in the severity of your feelings. And then incrementally, it, it's not an overnight Nothing in life. One of the things I think is important to notice is nothing comes overnight. Mm -hmm. I have been meditating, as you said, for nearly 15 years. And I do it every day. I've done it every day for more than 
seven, eight years now. Mm. So everything in life comes with perseverance and incremental changes. The brain is the largest, heaviest organ in the body. Look at the amount of time we spent, Adrian, as a society, making ourselves look more beautiful and stronger. We brush our teeth to keep the teeth healthy. We work out to keep the body healthy. We take a shower to clean the body. We do our hair. We do our makeup. What do we do for the mind? Yeah. What do we do for this organ that controls our entire experience of our existence? Mm. Not very much. So no. whatever modality anyone picks, just pick it and do it every single day because it'll pay off for you when it comes down to when, when the rubber meets the road, and then you're getting hit with things left and right because it happens to us all. It's so smart to to look at it like that because I think that is accessible to so many people. You know, you take care of your body, you work out, you, you know, your heart, there's a lot of focus on keeping your heart healthy, but your brain is the thing that is controlling, you know, your your heart. So it's exercising your brain and training it to think in a way that provides us with a beautiful experience of life rather than always being challenged, always being anxious. You know, it's it's so funny. It reminds me, I'm glad my son doesn't listen to my podcast, mm-hmm. but it reminds me of my, my younger son and he gets triggered by a lot of things and he'll say things like, you make me so mad. Like mm-hmm. you, you know, dad said this and it made me. Right. And, you know, I try to say to him, it's the way that you are perceiving what's happening, which is triggering you. And it's up to mm. you. you you're, you're allowing this to steal your joy. And he is not there, I, I think, maturity-wise yet. And I'm, I know he will be because he's a, he's a great kid, young man, excuse me. But it's, it's funny. I see the like, you make me mad is exactly what meditation, I guess, resolves, if, yes. if that's the, the sort of right word for that. Yeah. Absolutely. It's gotten to the point where if something happens untoward in my life, because it happens to us all, my husband will ask me, how many? Do you know what he means by that? It's like, how no. many sittings of meditation till you clear it? <laughs> and I'll be like, well, if it's really bothering me, I'll say three. Otherwise, I'll be like, yeah, I just need one. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go get it in to this yeah. afternoon. And then well, I'll get up and it'll be gone. Because yeah. I, A, I've cleared it, but B, I've realized I'm in the driver's seat. The meditation just brings me boop, back to center. Like, okay, yeah. I'm back. You know, the wise relational adult in me is back in the, in the driver's seat. Yes. And I can move on. Oh, so good. So I would also like, just for the people out there, to also just in a very practical way, you know, how did meditation, like maybe even give a, a scenario, how did meditation help you to make those strategic decisions that, you know, brought you success? Because you were saying you, you heard it all. I'm sure people told you, you can't do it. You're doing it wrong. All of the things, right? And I understand that it allowed you to, to make smart decisions, but can you maybe give an example? Because so many women out there, you know, yes, we can start meditating, but we are so gosh, there, there's just a barrage of information that comes at us mm-hmm. too. Like you need to market like this. You need to do yeah. this. You need to be on social media. You need to be like looking like a movie star. There's there's so much. I don't even know what I'm necessarily asking, but, but maybe can you give an example of a time where you either had to make a, a, a really tough decision or something was coming at you and you were able to use meditation to to make a decision that that you wouldn't have made otherwise? Oh, so many. Let me put it this way. One of the things that meditation taught me first and foremost is how to play the long game. Mm. In a society in which we over amplify short term gains and dopamine hits and things that give satisfaction at the very micro level now, it is really hard, especially when you're in the entrepreneurial journey to think about what is right for you and for your company and your employees and stakeholders three years, five years, 10 years from now. Mm. And it's, you know, it's called founders fatigue. Every founder goes through it where they just get exhausted because the yeah. journey is hard. It's not for the faint of heart. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. And it provides you with the staying power through it. So for example, do I part ways with a client or not? Is that might be good for me today, 
Do I take on this client or not? Oh, they're giving me a lot of money today, but is that the right decision for my business long term? Mm. Yes or no. Mm. Do I keep an employee or do I not? Do I sell my business to Raymond James or do I not? It's easy to go for the short term hit. It's yeah. harder to go for the long term values um, that really are driving your strategy and become your North Star. Your North Star becomes very clear. Mm. I'll give you a very clear example of this. I've been approached by other investment banks to acquire my business on and off through the years. It was easy to say no. Most of the entrepreneurs would be like, ooh, so-and-so investment bank is, is coming to buy my business. Let me quick figure out if there's a deal to be done and, and take the quick hit. The answer was no, because for me, one of the, 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 the prized assets that I had in my business was the culture we had created. It's 100% female-led. It's more than two-thirds women and minorities. We became the change we wished to see in the industry. Love so for it. me, to put the business in the right home was more important than just selling. Mm. And it was because of the meditation that I had that clarity of vision and purpose. Mm. And when Raymond James came knocking, I saw that they valued culture as much as I did, even more so because they'd been in the Fortune 300. They'd done it and grown and scaled with culture in mind. And even though I should have, yeah, I was told, listen, you, sh you could get a better offer or a higher offer with another so-and-so in investment bank. I chose not to go there because that wasn't what I was solving for. Mm. The values with which you live your life become very clear as to what you're going to put on top of the stack when it comes to your decision making. Mm. So good. It, it allows you to say no, which is so powerful. Because it's so easy to say yes to the things that exactly what you said are going to give you that short-term satisfaction. I love that you built a company and a culture that is focused on human beings versus profits only. And it's incredible. And can you talk a little bit just this is a, a little off to the side, but can you talk a little bit? So you were acquired and you are continuing to work at the company that acquired you. Mm -hmm. I just want to um, share what that's like, because hopefully there are people that are listening in the audience that will be in that situation. And that's a decision to make, right? Do you continue on with the company that acquires you or do you go off and, and do something else? And I'm sure there's a time frame there. Yes. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that if you're comfortable? Absolutely. It was always part of the deal with Raymond James that I would stay and continue to run and grow the business under their umbrella. And so I, oh, I've always been clear that I signed a deal and I'm going to live up to it. So there's something powerful about giving your word and, and playing it out, even though I, uh, you know, constantly the grass always looks greener on the other side, right? I could go yeah. off and do this, I could go off and do that. And my I, one of the things I would tell my kids and I tell many of the people who work for me is the grass is only green where you water it, guys. Uh, yeah. It's not green <laughs> anywhere else, wherever you water it. And, you know, I've, I've invested a lot in the relationships at Raymond James. They're wonderful people with a very supportive culture. And I've enjoyed growing the business here. But it hasn't been easy going from being my own boss for 10 years Ooh, to not yeah. having a boss. And that only works if the boss I now have is all of these things, A, supportive and B, enabling. And, and my boss, Jim Bunn, who runs, is the president of Global Equities and Investment Banking at Raymond James, is all of those things and more. So I again, I would not have sold the business to Raymond James had it not been for the fit between me and him, because that relationship was incredibly important, especially when I was very aware that I was going through a pretty big transition in and of myself from being the sole decision maker to yeah. now having a huge conglomerate who's, who owned us. Luckily, Again, when you have incentives, alignment of values, and most importantly, a collaborative culture fit with the people around you, you can work things out. We don't agree on everything. There's, you know, I come at things from a very different place as many of my colleagues do. Yeah. But we agree very, to res very respectfully, we agree to disagree. Mm. And we also know that, listen, when we make decisions, we may not have the perfect information, but we do the best we can and we move forward. And that's all one can ask for, right? If I know that my colleagues have, the, have they're coming from a good place with with the, with the best interests of the business and me at heart. No one's out to get me. Nobody's out to right. to get anybody in life, right? With very few exceptions. So if you're coming at it from a place of, I would say, empathy, people ask me to describe our culture all the time. I the phrase I use is it's empathetic leadership. 
So I'm you know, obviously I'm a woman, my CEO is a woman, we've always been female led. And the way we've come at all management decisions is from a place of empathy. And that yeah. doesn't mean we don't make tough decisions. We make tough right. decisions all the time. People are not right for us after a certain period of time. They might not be right for us as we're making hiring decisions. We have to make tough calls every single day. But we do it from a place of kindness and empathy. I, I like to tell my team, if you have kindness on one end of a spectrum and call it assertiveness, aggression on the other, mm-hmm. be kindly assertive and assertively kind. Like there's no mm. choice. It's all yeah. the same thing. Uh, yeah. Do it with the empathy for the, the human being on the other side of the table. I think in many corporate cultures, you become all about numbers and you lose that empathetic leadership trait, which I think is super important in today's generation. I totally agree with you. And I think it's the reason why so many women get burnt out to corporate culture, because there's only so much of that that you can take. And it's why so many women turn toward entrepreneurship, but it becomes a challenge for women because we, we, you know, we're kind of uh, taught and, and we've grown up in the corporate world. And then the way that things are done in corporate doesn't necessarily translate into entrepreneurship. And that's sort of where the struggle is. I just love this whole entire conversation because it really inspires me. My, I have this really good friend, Paulina Lopez, and she's always talking about the power pause. So it's, you know, whatever information is coming at you, just kind of like take that power pause. Mm -hmm. And meditation and everything that you've been talking about allows you to take that power pause, but to to even go deeper and align yourself with your values and figure out, you know, what what is the next right step for you? What are the things that are meaningful to you? How do you want to live your life? And so this conversation and everything about it and you have been super inspiring. So how can people, you know, if they're just looking to connect with you, um, if they're looking to just have you share your expertise, how can they get in touch with you? LinkedIn is the best place. Uh, One of my other big hacks, I, I spend very little time on many types of social Social media, but I am on LinkedIn. So just search for me, Sunaina Sinha or Sunaina Raymond James, and I'll come right up and please feel free to connect. I love to talk about all things, leadership, culture, meditation, wellness. So definitely get in touch. Well, you are the perfect guest for the She Leads podcast. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise and your wisdom and just your incredibly kind nature. I, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. I enjoyed it too. Thank you. This and all of our episodes are brought to you by the She Leads Podcast Network, the podcast network for women by women. Thanks so much for listening to the She Leads Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support us, please share it with others, make a personalized post about what you took away on social media, and please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. This helps our guests and our show to continue to gain visibility and traction. To learn more about how She Leads Media helps women to gain visibility, you can follow us on Instagram at She Leads Media, or you can head on over to SheLeadsMedia.com. If you'd like to network with me and other amazing women, don't forget to join us each year for the She Leads Live conference. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.